You ready to break them swords out? We're going to break them out in the sanctuary tonight. Praise God. Break them swords out. I hope it's short. Quiet. I can hear crickets right there. I said I hope it's short. Ain't no sense in having a knife in your pocket if you got a butter knife. That ain't going to do anything. You know what I'm talking about when I say sharp? Yeah. I'm talking about yeah. you're supposed to study to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. If you're not studying the word only yourself for what you do when you come to church, then, then we're failing God in our, our pocket knives, our swords is nothing less than butter knives. Because when the devil comes, if you don't know this word, you're going to be defeated. You might pull out the sword, but he's laughing at you. What you going to do with a butter knife? That's right, a two-edged sword. A mighty two-edged sword is what the scripture said. Amen. That pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. Well, we're going to get into the word tonight. Romans chapter number 15. And we started verse 22. And we stayed in verse 22 last week. So I'm going to read that and then we'll go to 23. So Romans 15, 22 is what I'll start reading that. This is what Scripture says. For this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. It's funny, we just got stuck on that last week. But the Lord shared a word with us. Uh, for this reason, I also have been much hindered from coming to you. But now, no longer having a place in these parts and having a great desire these many years to come to you. Let me go to 24. Whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. For I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you. If first I may enjoy your company for a while. Let me read verse 25. But now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. You see what Paul was doing here is he was writing to the Roman church, the Roman Christians, which is a place that he always desired to go. Paul always wanted to go to Rome. I kind of shared a little bit last week about the reason why Paul wanted to go to Rome because at that point in time, Rome was like the biggest place in the world. Rome was where all the empires was. It was where the great leaders of the world at that time was. And Paul knew that if I can get to a nation, i got to first get to the leaders. And just like we were talking last week, the Bible says when, when the anointing oil, they started pouring that anointing oil out at the head. They didn't pour it out on the feet. Now, Mary did that when she washed Jesus' feet as baptism. But the anointing is not a symbol of baptism any longer. Oh my God in heaven, I just felt that from the Lord, brother. The anointing is not a symbol of baptism any longer. It's a symbol of resurrection. So you don't start at the feet any longer. You start at the head. Praise God and you let it run down your whole body. Praise the Lord. You start at the head and let it run all the way down. The anointing, when it comes, it will start and it will begin to flow out. And that's why, hallelujah, to the Lamb of God, that's why you see a lot of churches and a lot of places, listen, the, the church is only going to grow as big and as, as much as the leader of that house is grown. What are you talking about, Brother Chad? I'm telling you, if the leader of the house ain't right, then the whole church ain't going to be right. Because it trickles down. That's why we got to discern the Spirit and make sure that the Spirit is of God. And we all are in this thing together. We know God is the leader of this house, first of all. I'm just, a, just an overseer is what the Bible says a pastor is. It's just an overseer. It's a shepherd that, that, that leads the sheep and feeds the sheep. But every direction and every leading comes from God above. Every good and perfect thing comes from God. He is the head of this house, not Brother Chad. I, I'm just following God. And if I'm not following Him, I can't lead you. Oh my God. Ooh, hallelujah. And if Brother Chad is not living right, then it's going to run out into this church. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. That's why we've all got to do our part. We've all got to, and my, my brother's keeper, why, well, yeah, you really are. Because if you see me doing wrong, I beg you, I urge you to come to me and say, hey, Brother Chad, I love, I'm coming to you in love, and what you're doing is not right. 
And I promise you, this is the first thing. If I'm in the wrong brother, then I'm going to say, hey, I am sorry. That's the problem with our nation today. And a lot of problem in our churches today is because people will not say they're sorry anymore. They act like they got it all together and everything is hunky-dory. And, and they're living their perfect life while everybody else around them is being belittled. But let me tell you something, child of God. Hallelujah. You must follow Jesus. And if you're not following Jesus, you sort of have no right to be belittling anybody else. Amen. Because nobody in this room tonight is perfect. But the scripture says we're striving to get there. Oh, hallelujah. I got to get back to Bible study. But we're striving to get there. Everyone in this room right now, I can guarantee you that at some point today or, or yesterday, or last, some of you may be really holy, it, it might have been last week, but somewhere along the line, you have slipped up and fallen short of the glory of God. Ooh, if you woke up this morning, I can assure you, you slipped up and fell short of the glory of God. Oh, I've had some people stand up and testify. Oh, I ain't never drank any alcohol. I ain't never smoked a cigarette. I ain't never said a curse word. Well, my God in heaven, Jesus didn't even need to come. You could have went to the cross and died for our sins. You ain't never sinned. You're sinning right now, you old devil. You lying is a sin. Let me tell you something. Every one of us in this room has fallen short of the glory of God. That's why we got to press on and just like Paul was doing, there was so many things that was coming against him. And, and so, so if anybody, what I'm trying to get all around that for is if somebody comes at you and looks at you and says, you're supposed to be a Christian. Has anybody in this room ever heard that before? You're supposed to be a child of God. Well, let me run, remind you about my Savior. <laughs> let me tell you about Jesus, what he doing. <laughs> he went into the temple. He began to bust over tables. <laughs> he made a scourge of whips and said, you better get out of here, you bunch of devils. <laughs> he got righteous indignation. <laughs> but caught my God, the devil beat him off. And then Jesus said, I ain't going to stand by and let this go on. I wish we had some Christians like that today that would stand up and say, we're not going to let this go on anymore. Instead, we become so passive and, and so easily to be offended and so easily not to want to break anybody else's spirit. And, and we're not supposed to break people's spirit. But if it's sending them to hell, you better tell that person, hey, get yourself together, man. Uh, get yourself together, sister. We got a part. We got a party to attend. Uh, amen. Jesus is throwing a wedding supper, hallelujah, in heaven, and he expects us to be there. I want to know if there's anybody going. Hallelujah. Are you going to the wedding supper? Praise the Lord. Well, the Bible said for seven years we'll sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's going to be a party like you ain't never experienced before in your life. Hallelujah. But there's so many things that's going to come your way and try to stop you from getting there. Paul experienced trouble after trouble after trouble. He, he had a plan, but his plan, this is what I'm trying to tell you tonight, his plan didn't always work out. Here's some real world news. When you plan something, you better say it quietly. Especially if you're a child of God. If you're a child of God, if you plan something out loud, the devil hears that, man, and he's going to try to stop every plan you have. Let me tell you, anytime I ever plan something, something usually always comes along and tries to hinder it or mess it up. But if I surprise the devil, hallelujah, if I surprise the devil, and then he don't have time to throw his little minions my way, and then I say, Nana, Nana, boo, boo, devil, I got you. Hallelujah. See, Paul, sometimes he just woke up in the morning and said, I got to go. I got to do this today. The Spirit will lead you and guide you. Come on. Hallelujah. Let me tell you what I'm talking about. In this walk that we call the Christian walk, you can't always plan stuff. You can't. That's the problem with the church world, the religious institutionalization of the church today. They tried to plan everything. They tried to organize everything. They tried to put the church in a box. They tried to put Jesus in a box. They tried to put the Holy Ghost in the closet. But let me tell you about what Jesus said. Hallelujah. He said the Spirit of God will lead you and guide you in all truth. 
We don't lead the Spirit. The Spirit leads you and I. Quit trying to plan everything and just let God lead it. And things will go smooth sailing if you do that. But when we try to plan stuff, all hell is going to come against you. You hear me? All hell is going to come against you. Has anybody in here ever planned anything and, and, and never had no opposition? Especially for the Lord now. Because, I mean, you plan stuff in the world and usually it just goes smooth. But when you start trying to raise up warriors for the kingdom of heaven, hallelujah, when you start trying to build a church, when you start trying to build a family of God, when you start trying to live right, when you try to stop an addiction that you have, when you try to start picking up more of God time instead of your time, when you begin to do things like that, it begins to make the devil nervous, and he will try to send all hell against you. But we know what Jesus said, his words written in red. He said, upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. So if it shall not prevail, that means he ain't going to win. That means I can keep going and quit letting it hinder my walk with God. Because so many times today, when opposition we may not get out of one verse tonight, I don't know. When opposition comes our way, we want to give up and throw in the towel. This week, Sister Santa, you know what I'm talking about. This week has been opposition after opposition after battle after battle after battle after you can't get over this battle before another battle takes place. But I'm telling you one thing. We're like the Apostle Paul. We're not just swinging at the air, praise God. But when we raise our hands to Heaven. Let me tell you what's happening. We're making contact. I'm not just reaching up into the air, but when I reach up, there's somebody else reaching down. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. When I'm reaching up, there's a God in heaven that reaches his mighty hand down. And go ahead. Let me get a high five right there, Brother Jeff. This is what the Lord does. He lets you know I'm with you. You're not fighting this battle alone. You're not going through this walk alone. God said, I'll give you my spirit to get you through. Quit giving in. Quit throwing in the towel. Quit letting hell get at you. Wake up, hallelujah. Arise and shine, for your light has come. And the glory of the Lord is upon you. Paul. Yes, sir. Follow the Spirit of the Lord. Yes, sir. The people can do exploits. That's right. Absolutely. You can read the people that you think you have never read. That's it, brother. Absolutely right. But the Lord will give you the word. Yes. That's right. And you say it with love. Yes, yes. And you get down on your knees and pray before yes. you go to people. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't, when you speak to them, it may drive them away and some bring them close. Yes. Prayer always works. That's it. Prayer always works. Always. Works. always. It does. Prayer always works. Now let me tell you, we, we went over this several weeks ago now, but let's let's back up like we done last week, hit the rewind button. You remember them old VHS tapes? Yeah. Be kind, please rewind. <laughs> Why was it a criminal like FBI warning if you record over this this tape, you're going to prison? I'm like, do what? I can't record days of our lives. <laughs> oh my goodness. We in trouble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Now, where were we at? I got through off with that day of our lives. I don't know, sis. I ain't watched it in years. I was a kid whenever mama got me into it. Hallelujah. Marlena had the devil in her. And Stefano, some of y'all know who I'm talking about because y'all remember watching it back here. Amen. <laughs> Now I know where all my days of our lives things are. Hallelujah. Let's get off of that. My grandpa says soapbox, bunch of devil washing and stuff. Listen. No good. Sitting there watching that cancer box. That's what he called it. Microwave was the same thing. He would not eat out of the microwave. No sir, no ma'am. And you know what? Most of those folks was probably right. Most of those folks was right. 
Paul said, for this reason, I've been much hindered from coming to you, but I'm longing to come. Paul was really longing to go to Rome. He was really longing. And he had a plan that he had made in his mind. Paul had come up with this, this plan that he thought was going to work out for him. He said, I'm going to go around, as I'm traveling around doing missionary work, preaching the gospel, I'm going to take up an offering. And I'm going to take this offering and give it to the poor in Jerusalem. You'll find out in a little bit that's what he's talking about. All these Gentile people that had got saved, a lot of them had money, material things. Where the Jews in Jerusalem was very poor. And he begins to tell them that they have helped you spiritually, so you need to help them physically. See, sometimes it's not only good just to, just to do it spiritually. You need to let the light of Jesus come out. And if you're not doing something good physically, then maybe spiritually you're not doing so good either. Because the works of God inside of you will manifest on the outside. Hear me now. Listen, if you ain't showing forth no works, it ain't about works. We know that. We know it's about God's works. But the Bible tells us in the book of James, he said, you believe in God, you're doing pretty good. But even the devil believes in God. What does he say? Faith without works is dead. So if you're a child of God and you're not producing fruit, you're not producing something that is from heaven in the physical realm. If people can't look at you and see Jesus on the inside of you, we're failing somewhere along the way. I'm not saying you're not saved. What I am saying is you are in that process of drifting. See, so many times when things are going good in a Christian's life, it's good, it's easy to keep trucking. It's easy to keep pressing on. But when the devil puts up roadblocks along the way, when he puts up signs that detour you and, and you feel like you're going a long way out of the way and you just ain't reaching the promised land, you just ain't reaching what you feel like is God's best for your life, it's easy for a Christian to get discouraged. And when you get discouraged, what happens? The enemy's already got you under his finger at that point when you get discouraged. That's why Scripture says, don't let the enemy steal your joy. Why? The joy of the Lord is your strength. So if the joy of the Lord is your strength, then you better not let the devil steal your joy. Because if he steals your joy, then he stole your peace. If he stole your peace, then he stole your happiness. Not only has he stole your happiness, but now he's stealing your help. And you'll start... Hey, William said it best. He said, I'm walking the floors, pining my, your cheating heart. Get the tell on you. He said, I'm walking the floors, pining my heart. That means it's going bad. It's hurting. It's broken. I'm in a process of grieving. And when you're grieving, you're as weak as weak can be. Woo! We're going to try to reach somebody tonight, Brother Tim. But tonight I want you to understand some grieving is not a sin, but grieving is a process that we all go through, but grieving is a process that we don't stay in. That's right. It is a process, and I, don't, I know I'm on Romans, I don't know why the Lord's leading this way, but maybe somebody needs to hear it. Grieving is not a sin, but grieving, it, it is a shortcoming. Because we put our trust in whatever we're grieving, we're, we're losing, we've lost. And, and, and I understand with our family, when we lose them, we grieve. That's a whole different story. I'm not talking about that. Even Jesus wept over his friend Lazarus. I'm talking about people, play, or places and things, different things that grieve you. That make you just hold your head down. It bothers you so much that it puts you in a state of stupor, if you will. Maybe I'm preaching to myself. But I've been at a place before where I've let so much weigh on me that I would just sit there and there would be people all around me talking and they'd they just be going on and on and on and I've not heard nothing they said because all I can hear is this blah, 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 blah. I, my mind's on something else. You, you're losing your train of thought because you've got so much in here. See, Christ said, I've come to set the captive free. The enemy wants to weigh you down. The enemy wants to put all that grief and all that burden and all that loss on you. That's not the way God wants you to live. God wants you to live free. And, hallelujah. God wants you to break the chains off your life. My 
matter of fact, he said, I'm the chain breaker. He wants to break them off your life. But you have got to open up and let him in. We, we try to keep those places hid, especially when we come to church. We don't want people to see our brokenness, Brother Lonnie. We want people to think that we're saved and we're on our way to heaven and we're happy and nothing is, is touching us. But the truth is, there's a lot of people that's in church today that is grieving, that is pining themselves away. They're hurt, they're lost, they're feeling weight that is burdening them down and pressuring them down. And they can't even, can't even get a grip on reality. Amen. Whether alone, supernatural, heavenly things. We're in this physical world, Brother Chris, and we can't even get a grip on it. Whether alone the things that God wants to add. But I've got good news tonight for those that are burdened. I've got good news tonight for those that are weighed down and in grief. Like I said, it's not a sin. We all go through that process, but the sin is when you choose to live in it. Come out from among that pig pen. Come out of that place that you find yourself in. Get free tonight in Jesus' name. Break the chains. Quit letting the devil take your reality. Quit let the Bible said, I want to give you joy unspeakable and full of glory. You want to have so much joy as a child of God knowing that you're not dying and going to hell, that you're going to heaven. That would be so much joy that you can't even begin to, but you're bubbling up so much you can't even begin to express the wonderful things that God has done for you. They want to be so much joy in our life that when we see somebody out in the street, we're like, hey, hey can I tell you about Jesus? Yes. Woo. And I understand we're living in a real world, but I also understand we're in the world, but we're not of the world. That's the concept. Jesus said, get your eyes off of the things that can be seen and put them on what can't be seen. For the things that you can see with these eyes is only temporary. But the things that you cannot see is eternal. The devil is trying to put your mind so focused upon your laws that you can't see the blessing of what God has given you every single day. And the blessing that is coming your way as a child of God that you have inherited now because you have joined the family of God. Woo! I heard a song a while ago. I'm talking about it fired me up. I was Brother John Fowler. I was out there changing spark plugs. I got the Holy Ghost and about fell off the hood of the truck. Man, I'm telling you, I began shouting and dancing, running that shop ain't big enough, Brother brother Rick. I'm bouncing from wall to wall saying glory to God. I'm, I'm talking about, and I was already upset, but I said, devil, you think that this is going to make me mad and it's going to hinder our church service tonight. But I got news for you, big boy. Hallelujah. Greater is he that is in me than he that's in this world. You don't stand a chance. You might as well go somewhere else. We ain't about to allow it. And that's the way every one of us in this room has got to get. Every time the devil comes, you go ahead and get the sword and dagger him in the heart. Break his heart instead of let him break yours. Amen. Oh, let me tell you. Amen. Woo, praise the Lord. Sister, ain't I've heard it. I know I have heard. I've actually experienced it. Y'all remember when you were teenagers? Y'all act like y'all religious folks. <laughs> act like it's never a teenager. <laughs> Do you remember? <laughs> Some of you, that's been a long time ago. <laughs> Hallelujah. Ooh, I better keep digging myself out so quick. Praise God. We love you, though. Out. Yeah, that's right. But do you remember in the dating world how you would always try to protect your heart? Remember that? Because there was always some people out there that would break your heart out and stomp on it. Oh, you was head over heels over them, but they just much rather see the man behind you or the woman behind you as even talk to you. They didn't have no care. And you remember how you, you kind of build up a wall. And you said, you know what? I'm not going to let another one hurt me like that. Come on now. I'm not talking to anybody in here. Or am I just talking to myself? 
I'm not going to let them hurt me like that no more. I'm fixing to get there. I'm going to have to hurry up and get this bus on the road because people are looking at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> Woo. I don't even know if I know what I'm talking about, brother Jim. Praise the Lord. You said I'm not going to let them hurt me like that no more. You need to go ahead and go back to them teenage years uh, and get that wall, which is the Holy Ghost, uh, that will help guard your heart. That's what the Bible said, to guard your hearts. Uh, for in this world, the daggers are being thrown at you. That's why Ephesians chapter 6 says, if you've done all that you can do to stand, just keep standing. Therefore, hallelujah, you've got to have the shield of faith. Uh, oh, hallelujah, the sword of the Spirit. And it says that you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. Those darts are flying, especially if you're a child of God. Has anybody ever played paintball in here? Man, that paintball, you don't know where it's coming from, but I'm telling you, you know when it gets there. You know when it arrives. Those things hurt. They hurt really, really bad. And I'm talking about you feel like you're in war. Man, you see people going around dunk, dunk, jumping and dodging and you hear something, it's like a machine gun. And you hear things going, zoom, 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 zoom. They don't really sound like that, but it's close. Then you feel it. Then you and then you feel it. it. <laughs> and it ain't like a, I was told, the first time I ever played that, I was told, it's kind of like a, a, it's not as bad as a bee sting. No. The devil is a liar. I've never had a bee leave a whelp on me the size of a silver dollar. Let me tell you, those paintballs, they will bruise. I actually had a friend, his, he got shot to side, and from right here all the way down, it looked like the state of Texas. I'm talking about he had the, he had the design and everything. He, it messed him up. Now, where are you going with this? I'll tell you where I'm going with this. Just like those paintballs, you've got to duck and dodge with the devil. He's got those fiery darts coming at you. You've got to learn to roll with the punches. But instead of giving up and waving your flag of surrender, you get your guard up. You put on that spiritual armor and you keep standing. Letting the devil know I'm not going to be pushed around. I'm not going to be knocked over. I'm not, hallelujah, I'm not going to let you intimidate me any longer. I'm standing on the word of God. And when I can't stand no more, I got big brother Jesus that's holding me up. And he's helping me keep going. How I, when I'm weak, that's when he is strong. Oh, hallelujah. We got to keep going. Every time you make a plan, something might come up. But who cares? The devil's a liar. And God said, I've got great plans for you. I'm going to show you what those plans are. With the help of the Holy Spirit tonight, I pray there one more day. I'll get it in a minute. He said, but now no longer having a place in these parts. He's longing to come to them, but he's been hindered. He said, now I no longer have a place in these parts, and I have a great desire these many years to come to you. So in other words, God is shifting him. I hope somebody gets this. God is shifting him, Brother Bill Webster, from one place to another place. There's times in our walk with God that God is trying to take you from this place and take you over here to this place. You don't know what's going on. Right. You just know it's time for me to do something different. It's time for me to move over here. It's time for me to lay this down. It's time for me to pick this up. It's time for me to say this. It's time for me to testify. It's time for me to pray for somebody. If you know that God has something different for you. Now, he said, all I know is that there's no more, that there's no more room for me here. Or there's no, what does he say? He said, there's no more longer having a place for me in these parts. And I have a great desire for many years to come to you. So he makes a plan. He makes a plan to go to Spain. And this is what he says in verse 24. He said, whenever I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. In other words, when I go to Spain, I'm going to stop by Rome. I'm going to come see you. And I hope to see you on my journey and be helped on my way there by 
you. Hear this. He said, I'm going to be helped when I get there by you. So here Paul is putting his trust in man. I want y'all to notice that with me. Paul, now listen, the Bible said that the laborers are worthy of their hire. There are some people that says that uh, they don't believe in, in paying preachers or paying evangelists or doing it. Now, I promise you, the no, you should not be in it for money by no means. This is for souls being saved. Amen. It ain't about money. It ain't about dollars. It ain't about anything physical other than seeing a physical body come up here and get a spiritual dose, hallelujah, of a life-changing Savior and a dose of the Holy Ghost. That's what it's all about. But Paul said, I need you. I need your help when I come. Listen, Paul was a tent maker, Brother Chris. He, they wasn't very decent job. They wasn't railroads and power companies and coal mines like they are around here. There wasn't many decent jobs at that time that made a lot of money. He, he, so he went everywhere that he went. He stayed with people. Paul visited city to city to city. And there he would set up a little shop while he was there doing missionary work. And he made tents. Paul was a tent maker. And he said, I've not sold many tents lately. And it's not going to suffice me to get to Rome and preach the gospel there. So I'm going to need your help. I'm going to need your support. Church, I come tonight to tell you something. Amen. And I didn't come. Did that just do something different? I think it did too. Hallelujah. Well, I come tonight to tell you something. I don't know how you think in your mind about this, but if there's a man or a woman of God that is doing the work of the Lord and we see them that they are in need uh, you and I we are to support them uh, if you can't support them financially then you begin to pray for them uh, that I'm not telling you just give them your money uh, that's not what I'm saying at all you and I listen Paul he said I need your help do you think the apostle Paul who wrote three quarters of the New Testament would be asking from help for from people that that was just normal everyday citizens do you think he really needed that Yes, he did. We need each other. Even though Paul wrote three quarters of the old, the New Testament, the Holy Ghost was downloaded in him. God had his back. No matter where Paul went, God had his back. But Paul said, I still need my brothers and sisters. We need each other. And it is our job to hold up our pastors, hold up our deacons, hold up our teachers, Hold up our evangelists. Hold up the people that speak and sing for God. It is time that we rise up and quit. Listen, do you understand that a preacher, nine times out of ten, preachers in a, in a local city, I have learned this over the years by going to different churches. Nine times out of ten, a pastor here don't like the pastor down the road. They do not, if you think I'm lying, I can I can promise you. They do not like the pastor down the road. They do they will they'll smile in their face. They'll shake each other. How you doing, brother? How you doing? Yeah, God bless you. How's your church doing? I'm telling you, they will I better get off of that. But I'm telling you, I have seen it firsthand. All it is is jealousy issues. All it is, is they're too worried about, is their church out doing our church? Let me tell you something. It ain't about numbers. It's about seeing so saved. And as long as you're in the, as long as you're looking at the numbers, and as long as you're looking, is this church beating that church? Then you are in it for the flesh and not by the spirit. And you're on the way to collapse. And the church is going to be locked up because the preacher ain't right. So therefore, the church ain't going to be. Well, there's going to be people that live for God inside. But that spirit that's on him will begin to get out on the people in the pew. That's why the scripture said there are many false Christs and false messiahs and false prophets in the world today. A lot of them don't even know that they're false. They honestly think they're doing God a service just like Paul did at the beginning before God changed him. Uh, well, the Lord's leading all different directions. Or either I'm chasing rabbits one. 
The Bible says right here, I've got a great desire for many years to come to you. And when I journey to Spain, I shall come to you. And I hope to see you on my journey and to be helped on my way there by you. If first I may enjoy your company for a while. Listen, right here, he's, he said, I want to just sit down and, and enjoy one another. That's why I love, and I hate we didn't get to do it tonight, but we'll get back next week. And if it goes to the next week, we'll, we'll, we might schedule outside service and break bread outside. That's why I love fellowship so much. Because it's important for us to come together. It's important for us to break bread and fellowship. It's important for us just to enjoy one another. Let me tell you something. That's how we come together. That's how we learn and we grow. And, and there's just as much. That's why in Scripture, in the New Testament, and Acts, when the church was born, there wasn't churches yet. Do you realize that? In the book of Acts, there was not any churches. There wasn't a church building over here and a church building over here. No, they met down at people's houses or they either met by a creek or a lake somewhere where there was a body of water because generally when they would preach the gospel, they had a whole bunch of people that was lined up wanting to be baptized right then. Why? Because they had a bunch of hungry people that said, I have seen what the Holy Spirit has done just the other day. And I want to know so what they got. I wish we had some people. Hallelujah. And I believe we got them here that's got a genuine faith, a, a genuine spirit filled. Hallelujah. A life that they live that they can show others and people will get so hungry for what they, not jealous, but hungry. Hungry. Yeah. When you look at somebody else's walk, don't you dare get jealous of them. Oh, no. Because the same God that filled them is the same God that will fill you. Yeah. You don't know how much work that person has put in or how much they prayed or how, how many wars they have fought to get to where they are. Don't dare be jealous of a sister or a brother. But you just say, hey, God, I want to my life. I want you to pour out your spirit like that on me. Amen. Desire. It's okay to look at somebody and say, man, I want to grow close to God like that. But don't you ever say, I want to be just like them. Because they, them, I feel like they, them, like I'm saying pronouns. For anybody listening by cell phone, that was not a demonstration of how people want you to talk. We... I'm going to leave that alone. I identify as a child of the Most High God that's been washed by the blood of the Lamb. Amen. I still know what that's going to go into. I still know what gender I am. Praise God. I have been touched and saved and redeemed and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. Praise God. I'm here tonight to let you know if you don't know what that's going to go into or whether your name is he, hey, she, they, they, and whatever, then you need a touch of God on your life that you will know how to identify. Praise God. There's not mistakes. God don't do mistakes. God made you for who you are. The devil's lied to you, deceived you, and tricked you into believing that you have no idea who you even are. And you need your identity in Christ Jesus. Amen. Just go ahead and repent of what the devil has tricked you in and ask God to turn your life around. And he will do it. He will make you a child of God. Cover you by his blood, deliver you from that lifestyle. I don't know who I'm talking to, but there's somebody hearing it right now. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I have friends that have been delivered from that lifestyle. Amen. Hallelujah. And I still got people that is living in that lifestyle that I know and that I pray for and that I love. Yeah. Yeah. I love them. Yeah. Yeah. They are people yeah. just like you and I. See, I got to get back to Romans. The Bible tells us. That no murder, no liar, no effeminate. Y'all know what effeminate means? Effeminate means who? Yeah. <laughs> a man trying to be a woman or a woman trying to be a man. That means effeminate. Yeah. No effeminate shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Says it clear as day in the book of Corinthians. But it don't stop there. It talks to the church after that. And it says these words right after it gives a long line of the ones that's not going to make it. 
It says, and such were some of you. Don't you forget what God has delivered you from. Don't you forget that you used to be a rotten sinner. I used to be a rotten sinner. Amen. And God has to remind me of that sometimes. And let me know, hey, you're not up here on a pedestal, son. You are still, you would be still in the gutter. Hallelujah. But I thank God, brother Mike, that he didn't leave us in the gutter. He lifted us up, put our foot on the rock, and lifted us up to the uppermost. Amen. He said, I will put your foot up on the rock and will establish your goals. That means he will give you you something to do. You ain't got to plan it out. You think I plan being a preacher? You know me before I become a preacher. I did not plan to be one. I said, Lord, no. Everybody that told me, them women in the church of God of Prophecy used to come and pinch my cheeks. And they said, you're going to be a little preacher man. And I said, oh, they're crazy. <laughs> they're crazy. But God has a sense of humor. And God, when I was laughing at them little women, God was laughing at me. He was saying, you just don't know, big boy. I'm going to wreck your world. Hallelujah. And God wrecked my world, and I've never been the same. I'm telling you how it goes. God said, you ain't got to plan nothing. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. You don't have to worry about anything, for I am your God. And I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. When you go through the waters, he said, I'll be there with you. When you're going through the fire, I'm a fourth man in the fire. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. Ooh. And so when you make plans, wait for God. Sometimes God wrecks them. Sometimes it ain't even the devil. Sometimes God wrecks your plans. I had a plan to go in the Air Force and fly, fly fighter jets. You know what happened? Poof. Wrong. Let me tell you, I was in the garden. I've never told this story preaching. Shin, I don't even know if you know it or not, but you can ask mom about it. I was in the garden. They didn't know I'd already went to the recruiting office and already signed up, already took my test. I was already ready. The recruiter showed up at my house and told me that I needed to be in Montgomery on Monday morning to get weighed and taped and ready to go. This was right after September the 11th, 2001. And I was outside in the garden helping my daddy. And I remember my mama coming out because the dog was barking. And I remember Mama coming out wanting to know who those men was in uniform. And I said, Mama, these are men that I talked to last week. About what? She said, well, about going in the military. Don't you know there's a war going on? And guess what? That ended my career as a military Air Force guy. As much as I wanted to go, that wasn't the plan. And I respected my mom. I love this nation and I would go to war right now for this nation. Because we're still living in the greatest nation. We got devils that are trying to destroy it. And trying to give it away. And trying to sell it for profit. But let me tell you what we still live in the greatest nation other than Israel. We still live in a nation that we have the freedom to serve God. We have the freedom. Hallelujah. Now they may be trying to steal it from you and I. But we still live in a great nation. It's time to get pride back in your nation again. They're trying to make that sound demonic nowadays. Right. If you fly an American flag. Right. It used to be if you fly a rebel flag. You was a racist bigot. But now they're saying if you fly an American flag. Are you crazy? Really? What is wrong with people? Yes. <laughs> Lord, deliver them from the, the I want to say stupidity, but I can't because I'm now behind the pulpit. Deliver them from ignorance. Because yeah. that's in the Bible. I can say that word. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Lord, wake them up. You ought to be very proud of the country that God has blessed you to live in. Yeah. I guarantee you go over to the Middle East in a third world country and you would beg to come back. Yeah. Amen. If you don't like it, leave it. If you don't like it, won't you do something to change it? There's the thing. We sure got plenty of illegals coming here wanting to change it. Why'd you look? Lord help me. Well, I'm done, brother. Turn off the news. Now, 
get into more news. He said, but now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. I, over here, there's no room for me. God's got another plan for me. So now I'm going from this point to this point. Has anybody in this room, do you know what we're talking about tonight? Where God will move you. Say you've done this all your life. Or you've been doing this for God. And, and you feel like you're comfortable. But all of a sudden God throws you into something. To where maybe you're not comfortable. You might know what I'm talking about. God puts you in positions. He's positioning his warriors. He's positioning his people. He's positioning the citizens. Just as the United States military positions people all around the world. God in his kingdom is positioning kingdom citizens all around the world. I read just a while ago, I found out that I used to be one of my best friends I grew up with. Spent the night with him every weekend or he with me. Just found out that he is in California. Went and moved to California in January and become a mighty pastor out there at a humongous church that he is. You know what they're preaching on? I hadn't talked to him in probably 15 years. But you know what he's preaching on? I read it on Facebook just a while ago about the kingdom of God. God is anointing people and positioning people. And he put on Facebook. I read it because he called me a long time ago. I hadn't seen him, but he did call me once probably seven years ago. He said, I'm deleting Facebook, so I didn't even think he had Facebook anymore. But he had a birthday today. And so it popped up, and I said, look at here, I ain't seen my friend in a long time. Clicked on it, and he said, God is sending us, and any time you hear something bad in the news about California, he said, I want you to pray for those of us that are in California oh, yeah. with boots oh, on the ground yeah. that are trying to win oh, souls yeah. for Christ out here. Because even though there may be some yeah. radical left wing yeah. far fetched out anyways, there is good people in California that are fighting for Jesus Christ, that are fighting for the cause that you and I are fighting for. And we need to pray for them that they will be able to arise and shine and reach the rest of that world, the rest of that state. Now, I got to hurry. Praise God. I got to get to the point here. He said, now I'm going to Jerusalem to minister to the saints. Let me read the next one. For it pleased those from Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor among the saints who are in Jerusalem. It pleased them indeed, and they are debtors. For if the Gentiles have been partakers of their spiritual things, their duty is able to minister to them in material things. That's what I was telling you a while ago. Those people who had been ministering to them and telling them about Jesus, he said, if you're able, they helped you spiritually. And if you're able, why don't you help them with their material needs? A lot of them don't have food to eat. A lot of them don't have shoes to wear. will not you help them? Buy them some shoes. Buy them some groceries. Do something good. They helped you and you helped them. You see, when Jesus comes in, the love of Jesus comes out. And it shows. It, I'm not saying take away from your family and give to somebody because God wants you to be stewards and faithful over your own household. Yeah. But I'm saying when God has blessed you enough and you have leftover over your own household, then you're able to run over into somebody else's cup. Come on. Yes. The Bible says, give and it shall come back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaking on, shaking together and running over shall men give into your bosom. What do you say, Brother Chen? I'm saying you can't outgive God. You cannot outgive God. Even when you think you might not can give, if you just sacrifice, God honors that sacrifice and you will be rewarded with something. Then that ain't why we give. We give because Christ is a giver. He wants you to give, not because he just wants you to give, but because he's a giver. Do y'all understand that? Yeah. That God is the giver of every good and perfect gift. Thank you, Lord. So it pleased him. And he said, therefore, when I have performed this, I have sealed to them this fruit. I shall go by way of you to Spain. After I come to you, then I'm going to go to Spain. And, and you're going to help me get there too, he said. But I know 
that when I come to you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. I know when I get there, Christ is going to bless my trip. He's going to bless me in the fullness of the gospel. I'm bringing forth the full gospel of God. I'm going to stop right there tonight, and I'm going to tell you now the point of this whole message. Paul was banking and planning on going to Rome. He was planning on getting help when he got there from the people. We find out in the book of Acts that Paul did make it to Rome. But do you know who paid the way? The government of Rome. It wasn't the people. Paul got through in prison. And that's where they took him to prison in Rome. Paul always wanted to preach on the frontiers, on the places where nobody else had preached before. You know where his frontier was? In prison. Mm -hmm. And before Caesar Nero himself, the most evilest emperor that lived in that day and age. Caesar Nero was the one who burnt Rome and Jerusalem, excuse me, burnt Jerusalem to the ground. He was one of the ones that took Christians and nailed them on the wall and would put some sort of flammable liquid on them and would light up the Christians as they were hanging on the wall when people would walk the cobblestone streets of Jerusalem the wall was lit up with burning Christians he said you want to say you're the light of the world I'm going to make you the light of the world that's Caesar Nero's comments this is where Paul was led to preach to Paul wanted to talk to the Christians God said no you're going to Caesar Nero Paul wanted the, the people in the church to help support the ministry. He said, no, I'm going to make the government of Rome do it. <laughs> Let me tell you about your plans. Your plans don't add up to a hill of beans to God. God said, I got plans for you. And your plans, all they do is get in the way. Won't you step back and just let me be God. Let me work. You follow my lead, God said. And when you do, maybe I won't have to throw you in prison and ship you off over there in handcuffs. <laughs> Y'all think I'm killing someone. I tell you, Paul was locked away on house arrest for years. How's he going to go out and preach and win the lost? Let me tell you what happened. If you read the last part of Acts, it'll tell you. There was people lined up outside his front door. Every single day, they would come in his door and would sit in his living room. As Paul was in handcuffs, he would preach to them the gospel of Christ. And the Bible said even the officers, <laughs> even the officers of Caesar Nero got saved and got filled up with the Holy Ghost. They had a touch from God. The plans of God are greater far than anything you and I can ever put into this little pea brain mind. I promise you. It's great to have plans. It's great to have a vision. But be led by God. Amen. The Bible said, where there is no vision, the people perish. I'm not telling you to think and not to think on your own. But I'm telling you, be led by God. Pray about it. Make sure your plans for your life is what God plans for your life. You want to be lined up in the center of God's will. If you're outside of God's will, you will never be satisfied. Oh, there is things you can do that is pleasurable. But only for a season. And then it leaves you disgusted. It leaves you feeling even more empty than you were before. Yeah. It makes you think, man, I've been wanting to do that my whole life. But now that I've done it, it's like nothing. It's like, what was I thinking? But when you find yourself in the center of God's will, it is something that will give you no greater joy than knowing I am doing what God has for me to do. There's nothing no greater than knowing you're walking in the center of God's will. Paul made plans. God busted them. We make plans. God blesses them. But I come tonight to let you know, all hell will come against you and come against your plans. But you've got to stand strong in the Lord and in the power of his mind. Amen. The devil might get a few blows, but God's already won the war. Amen. The war has been won. You are the church of the living God. You are the church triumphant, and you have no fear, no worry, because perfect love has cast all that out. Amen. 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 Let me see right here. Yeah, give the Lord a hand. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.
Hallelujah. I'm just going to read those last four verses. Just read them and we'll close up tonight. Three verses. Did you get laid off in the second grade? <laughs> now I beg you. 30, 31, 32, 30. That's four verses, brother. <laughs> you try to bust my plans, would you? Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ, and through the love of the Spirit. you hear that? Mm -hmm. That yeah. you strive together with me in your prayers to God. For me, Paul said, I need your prayers Amen. more than anything. I'm asking for your support. But Paul said, your prayers mean more to me than money to get me through. Pray for your pastor. Pray for the men and women yeah. of God that yeah. work through the church. Pray for your brethren and your sisters in the church. I'm not saying, but I'm saying lift up. Listen, people think that, that just because we preach the gospel that sometimes you're, you're stronger than, than everybody. No, we're not. We're ordinary men and women just like the apostles was. There's nothing different about anybody in this room than I am, Brother Matt. I'm the same. I, I break just like you break. I fall just like you fall. I'm no closer to God than anyone in this room, I promise you. And I don't claim to be. I talk to God every single day, but God don't love me no more and he loves you. I want you to know that you're special in God's eyes. We're all the same. We're all on our journey to heaven. And we've got to strive together. Pray for one another. But especially pray for the leaders in the house. Because battles that we fight. I promise you. You wouldn't believe some of them. That I may be delivered from those in Judea who do not believe. And that my service for Jerusalem may be acceptable to the saints. That I may come to you with what? Joy. Joy by the will of God. And I may be refreshed together with you. Now the God of peace be with you all. Amen. Amen. I love that. Let that be. He said, I want to come and be joyful with you and be refreshed with you. And you know, every Sunday and every Wednesday when we come together, that's what I feel like. I feel like we're being refreshed. We're being renewed. We're being revived. When you miss a service, brother, it's like, man, you yeah. miss out. Yeah. You miss out. Yeah. Yeah. You get a missed out. I'm glad you come. How about Praise God. He's got to be here. He's the secretary. They got to be. That's right. That's right. I'll be trying to play hooky. Now, listen, this is what an old, old, wise man of God told me one time, and I'm going to share this with you. He said, if you miss a service, that is one move of God that you will never get back. You might miss one of the greatest moves of God that you've ever experienced. Think about that when, yeah. when you just yeah. you, you're at home and you say, oh, I'm just tired. And I, just, I need to do this. God may do something mighty powerful that night. That dead might be raised. And you stayed at home and missed it. Now, I understand if you're sick, stuff like that, praise God. We respect our elders. We respect other people who have a weak immune system. But if you can come, come. Don't miss. Don't miss what God has planned for you. Hey, Amen. I'm thankful we got such a faithful congregation that does come. I listen, on Wednesday nights, let me, let me brag on y'all just a minute. Some of the biggest churches, not the biggest, but one of the biggest in Carbon Hill that I know, one of the biggest ones in Carbon Hill, told me, they said, what are they asked? Brother, how many of y'all run on Wednesday night? I, I said, Wednesday night, there's usually no telling, but we run we run close to 60 to 80 sometimes on Wednesday night. And we have had more than that. Yes. Yes. But that's on a faithful night, probably 60, anywhere from 60 to 80. He said, are you serious? He said, we might have 10, 11 people shows up on Wednesday night. They'll have 100 people on Sunday morning. But you can't get nobody back after that. They don't do Sunday nights either because he said Sunday night you might get four or five. So I'm thankful that you are faithful to the house of God. I'm thankful that you love God enough that you can understand that we got to love if we love God. We must love his house and we must love his people. That's a commandment from God. The Bible said that Christ loved the church that he laid down his life for it. 
And so if we, Christ loved the church that much, then I think you and I ought to love it too. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. I love each and every one of you. Anybody got any questions or comments?